Is it all set? Did you hit? I got it. All right. So we're on. We're going to have a different chapel today. Uh, open your Bibles up to Job chapter 12. We have been talking about the promises of God. It's been a while since I've been up here. Um, but we're going to kind of put the promises of God in a, in a parking spot for the moment. And we're going to look at something else. So Job chapter 12. And we're going to start at verse 7. Verse 7. Actually, it's, it's, a, it's a passage I've always really enjoyed, and at the end of this lesson, you'll have a better understanding why. It says at verse 7, but ask, but ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and to the fishes of the sea, uh, shall declare unto thee, who knoweth, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? And we'll go ahead and open prayer. The Lord, we just thank you for each student here, and it's uh, a nice spring day, a little cool. Uh, we uh, just thank you for uh, all that you've done, and we pray that you'll be with the elementary and kindergarten classes as they go to uh, the Sugar House, and that you'll be with us, Lord, as we. Uh, look at uh, your creation, and I hope maybe learn something uh, that we didn't expect today, Lord. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. All right. So, Job chapter 12. It's an interesting passage. And just to kind of look at it again. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Watch, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this. So, something happened here recently, and what we're going to be talking about is design and creation. All right? So, design and creation. Uh, we talked about this at the beginning of the year. We'll see how good your memory is, because this, this was mentioned way back in September. Uh, we talked about, we've been talking a little bit about the Roman legions. They made this maneuver and I'm trying not to say the name, very popular, very well known. Movies love to use this. You see any, uh, any movie, uh, a lot of times they'll throw this in. And it was created after something in creation. Can anybody tell me what? Turtle. Turtle, I'll accept that. Turtle or tortoise, there's a, there's a little difference. A tortoise lives, uh, turtle lives in the water, tortoise on the land. And it's kind of neat if you think about it, because if you look at, unfortunately my pointer doesn't work on the screen, but if you look at the tortoise and you see the shape on the shell, you can almost see a Roman soldier or a Roman officer standing there and maybe there was a seagull harassing it or something and it was pecking at its shell. And he's watching this and he's noticing the patterns in the shell and he said, you know, we can do that. We have shields that are shaped kind of similarly to that, that that tortoise's shell. So we can do the same thing as the tortoise does. And it became very popular and it was very, uh, very effective at protecting them, especially against arrows. So if they were facing an enemy that had a lot of arrows, they would call it out. And in Latin, it was tastudo, that was tortoise. So literally, they called the formation the tortoise. That's what they named it. But what's really kind of neat is if you look at creation, creation has inspired a lot of really neat inventions. And some of these I knew and some of these I didn't. Kind of neat. Velcro, a pet owner. This one makes sense. A pet owner noticed one day he was getting very irritated. Who has a dog and already knows where I'm going with this? The dog comes in and his coat is just peppered with the little burrs. And I had a, a long haired lab, chocolate lab. He was lab shepherd mix, beautiful dog. Uh, lived a very good life, almost 15 years, 14 years. And he loved to frolic in the backyard where he wasn't supposed to go. And he would come in, and that coat of his, it would take me an hour to get these burrs out of his coat. Well, this, this cat owner who, who ended up inventing Velcro was fascinated by this. And so he took a little extra science to it. And he said, all right, how is this working? And he noticed the burrs have little tiny hooks on them. And they were hooking, that's how they hook into the fur. 
And he said, kind of like the Romans did, hey, we can do that. And he made Velcro. And now today, if you look at Velcro, it's one side with something with little tiny hooks that goes into another side that's really, really fuzzy. So it's basically copying what is already done and been designed in creation. Now that bird does that. That's how the bird transfers its, it, you know, the seeds around by getting hooked up in the, in the animal's coat. Uh, butterfly scales. This one I had no clue of, and actually I didn't have time to really research it in depth. But butterfly scales have helped to improve thermal imaging cameras used by the military. I have no clue why. Supposedly there's a there's it has to do with how heat is trans heat and light is transferred through a butterfly scale. That it's done so in a way that it actually has some kind of effect on light. And somebody was studying that. They said, "Hey, I can do that." And next thing you know, they started improving our night vision gear. Kind of neat. I had no clue on this one. The first German fighter jets in World War II. They studied sharks and how sharks move through the water. Very trim design. Their skin is different than most fish. Very, very fast. And so they said, hey, you know, we, we're going to pattern our, the, the design of our first fighter jets after these sharks. Dragonflies have been studied for years for the, by aircraft, aircraft designers, because dragonflies, and I didn't, this I didn't know. I knew that they had studied them. Some dragonflies can fly 30 miles an hour. 30 miles an hour. Now, you scale that up to the human terms. That's fast. Here are some larger, the very larger ones are really something. Because there's different sizes of dragonflies. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's some really, yeah. And I don't even, I don't know a lot about, I know there's some big ones. And, uh, that's, that's about it. But I've always been fascinated at how they dart around. I didn't know that some of them could fly 30 miles an hour. But helicopters... And I'm trying to remember the, the new big, uh, within the last 20 years, is a fighter that, that rotates its, uh, yeah. its engines, okay? They're copying, they're copying the dragonfly, especially helicopters. How the wings, the two or four bladed uh, wings of the dragonfly, how it moves its wings and so it can hover and maneuver around. And also, how it's mostly very quiet. It can be, I can hear them, but they can be quiet. They can kind of sneak up on you if they want to. So they kind of studied that as well to improve, uh, improve aircraft. Owls, this may not be a surprise, have also been used to figure design an aircraft. Incredibly quiet, very, very quiet. Uh, the front of their wings, the feathers uh, kind of curve down and it moves the air differently than most other birds so that they can, they can literally, I have never, has anybody ever been out at night and had an owl fly overhead? You have? I was in a car, so I can't, it didn't mean anything to me. I was driving, I was, we were at Baxter State Park, and out of nowhere this owl swooped out of a tree across, across the road right in front of us and went to the other side. Uh, I've been told they're incredibly quiet. I can't imagine. Oh, they are, they're very quiet. Very quiet. It has to do with the design of their wings, all right? So they can catch mice and rodents and things like that. Well, again, aircraft designers have studied that, how they, uh, and also, owls fly very slow, very, if they want to. They can, they can glide very slow. So, uh, aircraft design, it's an, I don't know if it's the case, F-14, I think it is, the wings can move forward and back, and I don't know if that necessarily goes to the owl, but it, it can fly very slow. Octopus and jet engines, if you know anything about octopus, how they, how they move by uh, pushing water through, uh, that has, that's, jet engine designers have studied that. Uh, for improving the design of jet engines. This one will be a big surprise. Bats and dolphins, sonar and radar. Okay, the, We're still studying dolphins. There's still things we don't understand about dolphins. Whales also uh, is another one. Spider webs. Spider webs are stronger than steel if you scale them up. And so manufacturers have been studying that for years. Uh, and, and it would be probably in the military or uh, police, law enforcement for the jackets, Kevlar jackets, things like that, I'm trying to figure out how they can weave fabric that's as strong as a spider's web, basically. Uh, so that's been an inspiration there. This one I didn't know, the black mamba. Now, I know the black mamba is pretty deadly, and dark frogs are definitely. But the medical industry is studying them for painkillers. All right, so these are just a few quick examples about lessons from design. You've seen how the tortoise, if 
2,000 years ago, there's nothing new here. If you, go, if you go back to the Greek and Roman times, they understood this too, and they would study animals, they would study creation, and they would copy it. And uh, they would, uh, a lot of great inventions would come up. So something happened here last month involving this right here. The tree is still in our front yard. And who can remember what the woodpecker is called? Somebody, because you answered one. What do you do with it? <laughs> uh, actually, I'm glad you said that. He, he was named that. But what was the real name of the bird? What, what bird type? Anybody remember? I think I heard somebody say it. Yeah. All right. The pile, I'm not even sure I can say it right. Pile, pile, pileated. Pileated woodpecker. The, pile, the pileated woodpecker. And this is the tree. I took this picture yesterday. The picture on the right. He's been back and I haven't seen him. But he's been back because there's more holes in that tree. Because I counted at least three new holes in that tree since the last time I went out there. I'm kind of keeping track. And by the time he's done with that tree, there's going to be nothing left of it. Yeah. By the way, I read an article. They can't take a tree down. Yeah. They can take a tree down. We've had them do that on our road because we, we're at the woods. And we've got pileated woodpeckers up there. And that's all you can hear is right a tat tat when they get going. But boy, they've knocked trees right down. Yep, we will saw them right now. And actually, keep in mind, if any of you know where Mrs. Craig lives, that's what we're going to talk about, uh, where they'd like to live. So what we're going to talk about today is the pileated woodpecker. Look at God's design and creation. What can we learn from the woodpecker? Specifically, all woodpeckers. Uh, there's another one. Uh, I went out yesterday, and I, I've been, I always like birds. I just downloaded a bird app on my phone, an Audubon bird app. And I think it was a hairy woodpecker. Uh, what's that? Harry Woodpecker, they're big. Uh, it was up in the dead tree, uh, an old tree right beside the, uh, the garage. Really? And he was, he was going to town. So, anyway, if you look at this verse, and this is going to be our, the key that we're going to go after, uh, just look at the highlight. First of all, Job is telling us to ask something. Ask a question. And by the way, any good science begins by asking a question. All right, that's how we learn. Ask a question. Well, what's he want us to ask? Science and knowledge and learning all begins with asking something. Well, he says, ask the beasts. Okay, ask the animals. And they shall teach thee. Ask the birds. And they shall tell thee. Speak to the earth. Geology. All right. And they shall teach thee. And to the fishes of the sea. And it shall declare unto thee. So he's covering all of God's creation. The earth, the animals, the birds, the, the fish. And he's saying, ask it and it shall teach thee. What? That there is a God. But it will teach you other things as well, and this is what we're looking at. So the uh, pileated woodpecker, if you see up on the screen there, uh, that drawing was done by the James Audubon or wherever it was. He's got a beautiful series of books that I looked it up on eBay. And if you find an original first edition, it's several thousand dollars. It's really, really expensive. But if you know where to go, you can download the whole book for free as a PDF. Uh, and that's, that's where this image comes from. Uh, but you can see they live mostly in Canada, parts of Canada. And the, uh, I, I want to say east of the Mississippi, but they're west of the Mississippi, barely. And then a little bit down the west coast. So notice they don't really seem to care for the Midwest. And why don't you think they might not like the Midwest? Somebody said because there's cowboys there. <laughs> there's not a lot of trees. All right, now think about where Mrs. Craig lives. All right, so this is where they live. Now, here's what's neat. They are the largest woodpecker alive. And because there was one that was called an ivory woodpecker, there was about two to three inches taller than the pileated. And it's believed to be extinct. They don't know if it is. It also lived in North America. And if you saw it, it looked very, very much like the pileated, only it didn't have the white on the breast. It was all black. And it did have a crown, uh, but it had like ivory colors in it. So it was a little bit of ivory and uh, it wasn't white. So it's believed to be the largest woodpecker in the North America. There are about 200 species of woodpeckers in the world. Okay, all sizes. And the, the pileated is the king of the hill. All right, so it lives, and think of Mrs. Craig, it lives solitary lives deep in the woods. If you try to go out there, it was, I, I got several pictures of this thing. 
and Pastor John did too, but you had to be pretty cagey because its trick was that when you got too close, it didn't want to give up the breakfast, it would hop on the other side of the tree. So it's camera shy. And so no matter, I would go out there and it would see me coming and all of a sudden it would go quick, 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 and it'd jump on the other side of the tree and I'd try to walk away from it and reposition myself and it would, no, 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 and it would jump on the other side of the tree as soon as it saw me. But if you were careful, you could get fairly close to it. And we found a way by literally doing the Charlie Brown thing, hiding behind trees, and we were uh, literally uh, doing a, a stealth uh, a Green Beret attack on this thing, trying to get close enough to uh, get some video and, and images. Uh, it lives solitary lives, which is why it's going to like it a lot better out in Mrs. Craig's territory than here. So one thing that really struck me was, why is it out in our parking lot? Well, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, a uh, little bit later. Okay, he has a famous Hollywood cousin, and he does. Who is it? Woody the Woodpecker. And believe it or not, I thought this was kind of funny because I, I, I was, I grew up with Woody's. What came about back when I was a kid, but uh, not, has any of you even seen Woody, Woody the Woodpecker? The older people have, so some of you have. Maybe it's on Boomerang, or maybe it's on Boomerang on one of the old Cartoon Network channels. Here's the story: the guy who created Woody the Woodpecker, and I got a kick out of this. The guys, well, I know a few guys in particular, are really going to probably laugh at this. He woke up one night over a series of nights, and something a woodpecker was literally pecking a hole in the roof of his house. So imagine you're up in bed and in the middle of the night you hear and it was literally drilling a hole in the roof of his house and he told his wife I'm going out and shooting that thing. That's what he told Now he was a cartoonist and she said don't shoot it, why don't you make a cartoon character? Well he made Woody the Woodpecker. Now the woodpecker that was on his roof of his house was an acorn woodpecker. You notice it kind of has some similarities, it's smaller. But when he drew Woody, even though it was an acorn woodpecker, he patterned him, and he said this after the pileated because, and I meant to bring my phone, and I forgot it, and I had a nap, and I don't even know where, oh, it's right here. <laughs> Does anybody know how Woody the woodpecker laughs? Well, if I can pull it up real quick. So... So if you know what Woody the Woodpecker sounds like. Sounds like he's possessed. <laughs> that is the pileated woodpecker. All right? So he, he obviously took a little literary license with it because it's not exactly the same. But it sounds like he's laughing. So that was, that was the woodpecker that's up. It's out in the front of the yard. So this guy, he even though it was an acorn woodpecker, he drew. So next time you see Woody, that's a pileated woodpecker in cartoon form, uh, with a little uh, little changes. And uh, his his irritating characteristics is because it's, this woodpecker is trying to drill holes in the roof of his house. They also made a movie with Woody the Woodpecker in it. They did, not too long ago actually. That was kind of his comeback. All right. So here, if you're taking notes, here's what that was all my introduction. We're going to talk about some fun facts. All right, so you've taken, those of you who are taking notes, fun facts. Uh, we're going to talk about some design features, and then we're going to wrap it up. And hopefully you'll enjoy this. Uh, there's some, I, I learned quite a bit. Uh, I've been fascinated. And I'll tell you, here's the story with these woodpeckers. We live out in Durham, and Mrs. Ancona is a lot better with birds than I am. I, I know a lot about history and things like that, birds. I really love birds. But I've never taken time to really learn much about them. And well, she'd come in and she'd say, I just saw a pileated woodpecker in the backyard. I go running outside. He's gone. You know, two weeks later, oh, he's back again. I go run out the backyard. He's gone. We'd be sitting on the back having a cup of coffee in the evening or a glass of iced tea or something. Oh, there he is. He's up in that tree. You see him? And I'd be looking. And I said, no, I don't see where he is. Oh, he just flew off. I thought she was doing it to me on purpose. And she does this also with bald eagles. Oh, I saw a bald eagle, and I, I, you know, she's driving down the road, and she can see a bald eagle in flight, and I never see. I've seen like five I'm terrible. I would make a bird. Away. So that's and so I was. You don't know how happy I was. I literally the day I saw him, Pastor John told me about him. Well, I saw his post 
on Facebook. And I literally Monday came prepared with my camera, hoping and praying, and I think it's a testimony God answers prayers even for the silly things, that he would have this woodpecker out in the tree when I drove in Monday morning, and there he was. And Pastor John came, uh, actually no, it was Saturday during the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking down there, and Pastor John came up, and he says, you going to see the woodpecker? And I said, yeah. And I was recording it. Because I want to prove to everybody I actually didn't see it. All right, so, that fun facts. We'll start off with some fun facts. Genesis, and here's our key. What does the Bible say? Well, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly, and the moving creatures that have life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven after their kind. The Bible tells us a couple things, and by the way, verse 23 says that is the fifth day. The Bible tells us on the fifth day of creation, God created all the birds. So the great, 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 great ancestor of the pileated woodpecker, whatever it looked like, was created on day five. All right? That's what the Bible tells us. But what can we learn about this neat, this neat thing? First of all, we'll do a little biology here. Uh, it's in the class of odds, which are birds. Avian, or I would never say that. Aviators. So, and it's in the order of picaforms. Picaforms. And forgive me if I'm saying these wrong. I actually tried to look at the phonetics on it, and uh, I think I'm doing it right. Picaforms, that's the order, are woodpeckers and their relatives. And it has a famous relative. When I was a kid, I always wanted to eat his cereal. It was Toucan Sam. Oh, yeah. Toucan <laughs> Sam is a picaform. So woodpeckers and his relatives. So the toucan has that really big bird, yeah. bird beat kind of thing. And I don't even know if that cereal yeah, uses. Bill is very big. Bill's very. I'm sorry. Bill's very big. But very big. Bill's very big. Bill's very big. Uh, I don't even know if he's still the mascot. I haven't had my coffee yet this morning. Just sitting upstairs with the bowl. Uh, I don't even know if he's still the mascot. But toucans. So it's woodpeckers and their relatives. Well. As I, I, I kind of like to read all the stuff, so I said, well, what the, what, is, what the heck is a picker form? Well, woodpeckers and their relatives, they all eat insects. Okay? So that woodpecker out there, I had a few people that think that he was making a house. Uh, he was looking for a lunch. He's looking for him. Big time. And we'll talk about that. They love, uh, they love insects, though there are some, they'll, 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 they'll go off uh, the pileated will, and, and the desperate uh, day will eat an acorn. Uh, they'll, so they'll go after acorns. Uh, some will eat fruit. And there's one that eats beeswax. And I thought that was kind of strange. It was called a honey, honey glide or a honey something. And they said, well, it eats beeswax and it can actually eat it and digest it, which is unique. But the reason it's doing it is because of what's in the beeswax. And it's just not taking the time to pick to pick out the, 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 the bees. It's just eating everything. So it's uh, uh, eating the honey, the beeswax, and the bees, and the whole nine yards. So they all eat insects. Here's a really unique feature, and I didn't really, I've never paid attention to this. Their feet. They have two toes pointing forward and two toes pointing backwards. All right, which is unique, because most birds don't do that. Why, uh, every now and then I'm gonna ask a question for you scientists, why is that important? Don't answer just yet. I'm going to keep, keep that thought because I got a picture and we're going to come back to that. Why is that important? This was kind of neat. Don't, no down feathers at any age. They never have downy feathers. They're, they, they're born with regular feathers. They don't have the downy feathers. They range in size from about three, a little over three inches to 24 inches. And then, so that's paper forms. Then you have... I don't know, Pissad, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, I, I looked it up and it wasn't pronounced anywhere near like I thought, but that's woodpeckers, and then the pileated is a dry, Dryocopus pileatus, and we're going to come back to that, it sounds like a Roman general, uh, but in any case, we're going to come back to that. So that's a little biology, so uh, some other fun facts, they weigh about 10 to 16 ounces, all right? So they weigh about 10 to 16 ounces. They are about 16 inches long, which for, again, the woodpecker, these guys are the king of the woodpeckers. They are the biggest. So what you saw are out in that tree, they don't get any bigger than this guy. And as you can tell, they can do some damage to a tree like nothing else can. They can really, uh, really do a number. Their wingspan, about 27 to 30 inches. Uh, they live 9 to 13 years. 
Which for a bird, that was kind of impressive. That kind of surprised me. Uh, they can eat 2,000 ants a day. They absolutely, and by the way, you know, my number one favorite dish is a nice bowl of spaghetti with black olives and garlic bread. Well, if you ask a highly aided woodpecker, ants. Number one on its list. And chances are, a carpenter ants, they don't, they're, they're non discriminatory. Any kind of ant, they like them. Chances are, that's what that was after. All right? Ants. And they'll eat 2,000 ants a day. They absolutely love ants. Uh, there's one in flight, really pretty, by the way. Occupies a home range, the same home range, for up to 30 years and four generations. So they're kind of territorial. Bald eagles are the same way. They'll pick an area and they'll live here. Chances are that was probably been living in all the wooded lands going this way and behind us. It was probably living along the river. All right? Uh, they'll cover territory up to 1,000 acres. Population density, studies have found population density of these woodpeckers decreases by 80% after harvesting of trees. So here's, they, remember I said earlier they are shy and they generally don't like park areas or you know any place where they're going to run into people. We just harvested all the old growth timber in its home territory. And so this thing is looking, it's looking for lunch. All right, with this little lot of land we have here. There's still quite a few trees out there. And there's still some trees that's probably going to be able to eat from. But these are old timbers, old pine trees. And so it's it probably, it, I noticed this happened during February vacation. Yeah, the church had been quiet a while, and I think it had been flying through. And I don't know how they could, they could hear, basically. They can hear the insects moving in the trees. And it noted that that one in there, and it's probably, hopefully there's not another one, because he'll take on the other one, too. Uh, so he, he started picking away at it, and then he got a little nervous when the kids started coming back to school. And that's when he, he noticed he started kind of, he, she, by the way, I saw both of them with female. So here's the test. If you look at these two pictures, we ask questions every now and then. What is the difference between these two pictures? Again, I'm going to try to move around because you've had one. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, the white hair, and also the brown color on, the, uh, on one of them. Yeah, actually it's good. One has brown, but this... Something else I'm looking at, it does have red hair, but something a little more specific. Uh, one has almost all white in the face and the other doesn't. A little more white, yeah, there's something, you're, you're getting warmer. <laughs> yeah, and that's important. Uh, one has red on the face and one doesn't. One's male and one's female. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then here's a little here's a little biology for you. Here's how you tell the difference. And I went through, back through my pictures after I could figure out how to tell the difference. And I have a picture of both the male and the female. So there was they were taking turns. They were rotating on that tree. There wasn't just one. There was two. And somebody said that to me in a Facebook post. They said, "Are you sure it's one?" I said, "No, I don't know that it's one. I've only seen one." Uh, and so I went back through and checked my pictures, and sure enough, the female is all black up near the bill. And if you notice, the male. That's the big distinguishing feature. It has red right behind the bill. So that's, that's the male. And the male, somebody said it, is a little bigger. Now, actually, it could be just, these two aren't necessarily a couple, so it might be a young one or something. But the males are bigger than the females. Uh, they like to live, and I never heard the term before, they like to live in what's called snags, old dead trees. So that's what they like to live, De defoliated trees. Big old dead trees, and what's really interesting, uh, actually I think we'll talk about that here, the nesting fact. So they like big old dead trees. They, if there's not a hole already in it, they will make a hole. It won't be a hole like that, it'll be a little, it'll be a round or a triangular shaped hole, and they believe in have their, their safety conscious, they believe in having fire escapes. They have multiple entrances. So if something comes in the front door, they can go out the back door, they don't get trapped. So they're pretty smart. So they will customize their tree. They go find a big old dead tree, maybe has a rotted spot in it. They hollow it out, and then they make two little escape hatches so that they can get out multiple ways. And that's where they set up their nest. In the daytime, the parents will take turns uh, laying on the eggs. This I thought was interesting. Nighttime is all dad duty. Mom, they, according to the, I'm, it's like, a, who's going around checking this stuff? But that's what the article claimed. That dads only sit on the eggs or incubate the eggs at night, uh, and mom is mom is eating ants. 
or something. I don't know what she's doing. Uh, generally, four eggs, though I found some articles that's less, but four eggs, and it takes about two weeks to hatch. And they mate for life. All right, so they're kind of in the category of eagles. A lot of the raptors do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so they mate for life. Uh, and they've actually had cases where they've tagged them, and one of the mates has died, and the other will stay right in the area. They won't leave. So you have to make that. Uh, how do you know that they're around? This is a picture on the far left. That's my daughter a few years ago. That's in Acadia National Park. We were doing some snowshoeing. I had never seen that before. My Audubon loving wife, again, she, she said, I really don't know that much about birds. But when you know zero, anything above zero is quite, a, quite impressive. So she said, oh, that's a hylated woodpecker. I said, it is? Uh, I said, looks like somebody with a jackhammer went crazy on the tree, you know, because I just I didn't know they could do that. Look at the tree, the, the, the picture in the middle. They literally started from the ground or from whatever the case is. And that's quite a that's quite a hole. They will, like I said, they will literally do a number on it. And the one on the far right is ours. And if you look really closely and you look especially at the top, you can see it's kind of punky looking on the inside, and you see holes. Big black holes. Bugs. That tree is infested. Matter of fact, I was talking to one of the trustees that I said, that woodpecker just did us a favor because that thing would have blown over someday. And we, it would have been standing and then one day we would have come in and it would have dropped right down. He went out, found the tree, says, hey, there's a lot of bugs here. And he's made it very obvious that tree's done because he's been drilling holes in it. Uh, they prefer, actually, the tree to, to your right. They like the big old trees that fall down in the woods. They get, they get loaded with bugs. And they just sit on it and it's the buffet. All right, but if they're their fallback, and they'll also uh, do like they did to, to the tree in the front yard. All right, but so they go after fallen and diseased trees. Here's the, the neat thing. I was reading a forestry magazine. My background actually is in, in uh, I worked in a building home center, and we bought a lot of West Coast timber and Canadian timber, and we would go to training sessions on on you know, the ecology of, of trees and stuff like that. And actually, they say woodpeckers are a keystone species. Uh, one, because they, they eat so many bugs, ants. And two, and I never thought about this, they encourage rot and decay. They help things break down. Because the trees that are rotting, that has the bugs in them, they go and they rip it, they open it up, which allows bacteria and stuff to get into it. And that breaks down, and that's very good for the soil. And so they're actually very, very good for a, for a, a large timberland area. <laughs> Evidence of their activities, that's our tree in the front yard. And some of you may have noted, why do I have a bunch of wood chips and a dollar bill in my, that's, that's why, that was from, just for perspective. These are some pretty big wood chips. And I used to sell, I meant to bring one in today, I used to sell a Marple's wood chisel. And I don't expect that to be any of you. Very, very expensive. It's one of the best sets out there. And, you know, for, you need a really good wood chisel, pretty sharp, to, to get uh, splinters or wood fragments that big. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in design features. So there's some fun facts. Now we're going to see why this is important. All right? So, Romans 1.20 tells us, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so they are without excuse. What that verse is very simply telling you is that when you look at the world, it tells you one thing. If you really study it, there's God. Because there's no other way to explain. We can try all we want through science and through other methods to explain how things got here. But the, the Bible tells us that creation proves that there is a God. And so every now and then, you might have heard the phrase, it used to be told to me by my grandmother, stop and smell the roses. <laughs> so every now and then, no matter what I'm doing, and I did it with this woodpecker, I would take, if he was out there, I'd take a few minutes and just watch him. And just watch how he acted, watch how he behaved, took a little time to read up on him. And the more and more I read, and I'm going to share some of the things I found out, I said, wow, this is pretty impressive. So, what? First of all, why are his feet 
two backwards and two forward facing talents or claws and feet. Why is that important? I think you had your hand up before. Up and down trees. Yeah. Most birds don't have that kind of foot in range. That makes it very, if you watch them, they, they can scamper all the woodpeckers. And there's, a, there's, a, there's another bird, nuthatch, is it the nuthatch? Nut she loves the nuthatch because they can go upside down. They can sit there and just run up and down the trees. Well, they got special claws for that. That's a design feature, all right? That's the only reason they can do that. Uh, they also have stiff tails. And we're going to look at that in just a minute in another picture. The name means tree cleaver. That's what that means, tree cleaver. So it, cle it could cling to trees because that's what the pileated woodpecker's name means. This is the picture I took. Look at the tail. What's it doing with its tail? Somebody tell me. Matthew. Trying to hold itself up. Yeah, balance. So it's got, it's got the, the strong claws, but it has a tail that's a lot stronger than most other birds, and that tail is, I would watch him as he was hammering, that tail would press right into the tree. So he's using that tail to, to, to help stiffen himself up and hold himself. And he's actually, at that point, he was, he was digging stuff out of there. So a strong, stiff tail, all right? There, there's a Woody in action, as they called him. Uh, loves ants, flies, mosquitoes, moths, grubs, seeds, walnuts, acorns, buttworms, and bark beetles. Anything that's nasty that lives in trees. That's why this article I read in the Pacific uh, Coast, out in Oregon, out in that area, uh, they, they say they're really concerned when the population of the woodpecker goes down because bug, po bug populations go up. They control the bug po population. Mm -hmm. We're worried about bats right now, because bats, brown bats, I think it is, have been, uh, yeah. and white, yeah, bats, white nose, uh, they've uh, had some kind of disease, and bats eat tons of mosquitoes. All right, so birds, all right, if you start seeing more and more mosquitoes, it's not a lot, there's not a lot of bats, or there's less bats around. So the woodpeckers are really important for those irritating insects. Here's another interesting design feature, really this is the best picture I could find, really hard to see, but if you look on the top of his bill, he has tufts of feathers covering his nose. That literally, they come down his beak and they go right out over his nose. Why would he do that? Anybody into woodworking? Yeah. You ever done some woodworking? I'm out there sanding with a sander. My wife says, why don't you have your dust mask on? That's uh, because I'm stupid. You know, and then you come in and your, your nose is all clogged up with sawdust. Well, it's because he had, other birds don't have, they don't necessarily have that kind of design feature. He has that design feature because God has made him so that he won't be inhaling uh, the, the, the wood fragments. All right, but we're going to get into a little, uh, little anatomy here. First of all, think about this. Here's the most fascinating thing about woodpeckers that you may not have stopped to think about. The average woodpecker fa uh, faces deceleration forces of up to 1,200 Gs, 1,200 times gravity, when its head hits a tree. 1,200 Gs. Every time that woodpecker is out there and he's going... <laughs> It's been estimated at 1,200 times gravity. Humanly speaking, we cannot tolerate over 300, or we will face serious concussion or brain injury. Okay, 300 times, and that's, that's the maximum that we can do. A woodpecker can withstand 1,200, and there's some working theories out there that they think some can, can face up to 6,000 Gs. And 18 to 22 times a second. So that would be like you, and I'm not telling you to do this, going out to a tree and in one second hitting that tree as hard as you can with your forehead 22 times. I don't think they'd make it and being able to walk back to school on your own two feet without an ambulance helping you. So, you know, you may not have stopped to think about that, but how does it do that? And that's what we're going to look at. How is it able to do that? First of all, the brain is cushioned inside a strong, a strong skull. Right. Has a very, very strong skull, proportionally speaking, compared to ours. It has strong muscles that hold the neck straight. And, I, and again, this article is fascinating. And it said, think of this. If it didn't have extremely strong neck muscles, 
And when its beak, that long beak, hit that tree as hard as it does, and if that muscle wasn't strong, it would break its neck. It would just... <coughs> so it has really, really, really strong neck muscles. And not only are they strong, but they're so strong that they make it so that that bird cannot even be at an angle. It's not just about holding the strength, it's keeping them straight. If you look at a wood chisel, very, very straight. All right? So they have very, very strong neck muscles. Some woodpeckers have tongues with bars or <coughs> sticky tongues. The pileated, I think his tongue is six inches long. And it is so long, and we're going to talk about this, you'll see in the picture, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. That's his tongue. It goes underneath his skull, around the back of his skull, over the top of his skull, and comes down and ends right near his nose. All right? That's how long this his. And by the way, the article I read says pileated woodpeckers have short tongues for woodpeckers. They're on the short end of the spectrum. And that's, that's, their, that's their tongue. All right? The brain cavity. First of all, the, the brain cavity of the skull is very compact. What's that mean? We have a fairly large. We have a little, little, bitty brain inside a fairly big skull. And if you hit your head while you get concussions, your brain's bouncing around inside the brain skull. Yeah. Uh, around, it's, but that doesn't happen with the woodpecker, because the woodpecker's brain cavity is very compact, which basically means there's very little bounce room in there. All right? That's first of all. It is broadest in the front, so it disperses the impact. The skull is fairly broad in the front, so when it hits the, it hits the tree, it disperses the impact. It has special skull bone containing spinal fluid, which helps cushion everything. All right? The tongue, remember we were, we we're going to get back to the tongue? It cushions the brain. The tongue uh, has ligaments in the back that force. It goes all the way around the back of the brain, and it actually acts as kind of a shock absorber so that it's, if any movement, the tongue is helping to control that. And on top of that, Here's the thing that almost grossed me out when I read this, so it was like, wow. The, the tongue goes, that blue line is the jugular vein for the woodpecker. As the woodpecker, think about how fast we've been talking about, is doing that, the tongue is constricting on the jugular vein to trap minute amount of blood in the brain that helps cushion it. I said, that is kind of gross. But, so it tightens against the jugular vein, restricting the blood flow out of the brain that adds a little bit of extra cushion. So all, all these things kind of added together. The upper and lower beak, if you take a look at the drawing, the upper beak is slightly longer than the lower beak. And here's the interesting part. The upper beak changes shape on impact and is more elastic. So the upper beak is a little longer and it has a little bit of a flex in it. The bottom bill is incredibly strong. That's the chisel. The upper beak kind of starts, it's kind of like the punch that kind of gets it, gets it locked in, and then the, the, it, it kind of pushes back, and then the lower beak hits. So incredible design there. Again, think about it as I said, you see this. You see that this is, this is God. I mean, you can't. Things like this just don't happen. 99, all of this means that 99% of the impact is forced away from the brain and down the neck muscles. So all this adds up that it's actually dispersing the, the, the force of the impact. And on top of that, at, where the, the beak and the bill, uh, or the, the beak and the skull uh, attach, there's a sponge-like cushion. So that the beak is the beak is kind of going, there's a little flex in the whole beak. So you've got the front bill is flexing, and then you've got the whole beak is, is got a little flex because there's a little bit of a cushion in there. So that's kind of neat. Here's the other thing. So we already found out that its nose, it has, it has feathers on its nose, so it has a dust mask. So we have a very OSHA-friendly bird because this bird has three eyelids. It has an upper and a lower, just like we do, and then it has a horizontal, and it's a clear membrane. And it is all automatic. So the, the, the tongue is compressing on the jugular vein, the bills are flexing, and every time it hits that membrane, or as it's working, that third clear membrane moves across the, uh, the, the clear eyelid, moves across the eye, and it's safety goggles. So, like I said, we've got an ocean friendly bird. He's got his dust mask on, and you shouldn't go out in your orchard without all your, your safety equipment. 
So one person says, what does all this mean? Think about this. One millisecond before a strike comes across the bill, dense muscles in the neck contract and the bird closes its thick inner eyelid. Some of the force radiates down the neck muscles and protects the skull from a full blow. A compressible bone in the skull offers the cushion too. That's the, that's the B. This is all in a, like in a millisecond. This happens automatically, just like we breathe. All right, contact sports, as we kind of wrap things up. Contact sports and concussions. Mm -hmm. Football has studied the woodpecker. <coughs> and they have studied the woodpecker to design the helmets in any contact sport in this end so that they function like a woodpecker does. They're trying to duplicate that. And that was kind of fascinating. And what I did not know is they're actually coming out with collars that are high pressure collars that go around, especially on the front linemen, go around their necks. And that is to help restrict blood flow in the jugular vein, trapping minutes, like I said, like a teaspoonful of blood in the brain that helps cushion the brain and protect it from injury. Hmm. They're copying a woodpecker. Think about all the things we talked about, the Roman legions, the Velcro, also a high impact machinery. Uh, they said the, the, the industrial uh, application, high impact machinery, anything that has a high force, they literally have employed some of the techniques they've seen, and I forget what the percentage was, it was pretty high, the wear and tear they're saving on the machinery because they're employing some of the things they found in the, in the woodpecker. Hmm. All right, so wrapping it up, remember the question about asking? All right, ask the beast, the fowls, speak to the earth, the fishes of the sea, and it will do what? It will point you back to God. Uh, one, one scientist concluded with this on the pileated woodpecker. These features stand in a row. Think about everything that we've talked about. These features stand in a row sequentially cushioning and dissipating the mechanical excitations. You can see the scientist. Uh, sequentially cushioning and dissipating the mechanical excitations, preventing brain injury. Other researchers confirm that it is the combined effect of these features that confers protection rather than any single factor. In English, what does this mean? In English, what this means is the combined effect of everything that we've talked about, the combined effect of these unique features protects the pileated woodpecker. If, if you look at evolution, as this bird evolved and it didn't have everything at the same time, it's not a woodpecker. And it's, it's going to kill itself. It has to have it all. It's a package deal. All right? The only thing that makes sense is it was created on day five. Uh, we've learned how uh, mankind has benefited. If you look at anybody who, who uh, especially with a Christian background, especially if you go back a few hundred years, uh, George Carver is one, talked about the only book he brought in his science lab was the Bible. All right? You started with scripture. Because we learn from God's creation. Most of our greatest inventions have their origins in creation. And finally, it all points to God. All right? As it says, that we are without excuse. So when you're walking through the woods or you're out doing something, as my grandmother used to say, stop and smell the roses. Stop and watch that bird. Watch the animal and see how it does what it does. And then ask a few questions. I never dreamed in a million years. I knew woodpeckers were probably pretty special. But I never dreamed half this stuff. It was, I was like, really? That's just wild. Uh, and I do not advise you to go out and hit your head against the tree. <laughs> Please don't. Something for just a second. All right, we'll close the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you again for everything you've done. And we pray that you'll just be with us, Lord. Uh, and just help us to meditate on, on the woodpecker. Uh, and our, our friend that was out there for so long. I, I hear him actually in the woods. Uh, just yesterday I could hear him out back somewhere. Uh, just help us to meditate on uh, the things that we've learned from him. In your name, amen. All right, let me take over.